The Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander Read by Lisette Prende Damnation! I wish they would hurry up! David Bruce stamped his numbered feet upon one of the few reliable planks in the landing stage, which threatened to collapse under his vigour, and blew upon his hands, rough and contracted by the cold. The only person within hearing, Sonny Shawman, a lanky youth whose manhood was not yet under way, hung shivering over the side of the black punt that was moored to the rotting piles of the little wharf. His hands were tucked under his armpits. His bottle green eyes glared miserably up at the horizon, now tinged with a weak glow from the rising sun. Are you sure you told them seven o'clock? demanded Bruce, kicking at a piece of lichen. Yes, certain, mumbled Sonny. The tide, running out fast, made little wakes round the square ends of the punt, which was a huge coffin-like craft, full of furniture and boxes partly hidden under a new tarpaulin cover. The creek, here little more than twice the width of the boat, ran deep between lines of mangroves, the dull green of their stiff leaves relieved but little by the flat yellow berries, which seemed to continue the colour scheme of the clay in solution in the river, recently flooded by spring rains. Walled up to a high horizon on either side was virgin forest from which a mist, getting lighter every minute, was slowly lifting. The wharf, the punt, and the two men looked as if they had been dropped from the clouds into the depths of that remote ravine. There seemed to be no way in and no way out, but as the fog shifted they could see, about half a mile along another gully, a white, small school and teacher's house set on the side of a hill. The eyes of both Bruce and Sonny Shawman now gazed with fierce interrogation upon these humble buildings. As they looked, the forms of a man, two women carrying babies and a child, all laden with packages, took shape in the mist. Only occasionally as they came on were they seen by the impatient watchers by. The punt for the road, which was carved round the spurs of the range, lay mostly under cover, and it seemed to Bruce that there passed eternities of biting cold before the welcome sound of voices and the squelching of thin mud made music for his urgent ears. Indifferent as to the personality of the boss's wife and children, who were to be his passengers, Bruce began to loosen the ropes. When the party finally appeared round a Thai tree clump and reached the creaking wharf, he turned, raising his cap to Roy Harding, the schoolmaster, and his wife, whom he knew well. Then he looked casually at Mrs. Rowland. He was, inches, he was instantly conscious of his deficiencies. The devil! Why didn't I shave? He growled inwardly. As they moved on towards him, he suspected that Alice Rowland was what the washerwoman called a real lady. And he saw that in spite of a hard black hat and a rather ugly brown cloak, she was a young and very good looking one too. He saw that she was tall, and that though she carried a baby and a basket hung over her arm, she moved gracefully. He had time to notice her good colour, her straight features, and the coils of chestnut hair upon her neck before the party stopped before him. As Alice turned her grey, day of judgment eyes upon him, with a look that instantly judged him and dismissed him from her consciousness, he realised how much she resented being formally introduced to him as an equal. He did not know that never before had she been presented to anyone who looked as unprepossessing as he did at that moment. He was only too conscious of the marks of his recent short but reckless whiskey drinking. His fine brown eyes were strained and bloodshot, his hands red and dirty, his hair uncombed, his hat guilty of indescribable disreputableness, his battered dungarees smelling of river mud, tar and stale tobacco. It would have taken a connoisseur in types to have realised his possibilities. It was not remarkable that on that particular morning Alice Rowland failed to perceive them. He saw only, she saw only the dirty clothes, the unshaven face, the bloodshot eyes, the shrinking manner, all that she had been taught to connect with the name of Pariah, 
and forgetting for the moment that she was to be dependent on him for an unknown river journey, she barely acknowledged his presence. Bruce scarcely had time to flush before Mrs Harding turned to him, trying to ignore the unfortunate manner of the woman she had introduced. "'We've not seen you for three weeks. How's that?' she asked. Bruce smiled gratefully at her. "'I've been helping Mr Rowland with the house,' he answered quietly. "'Why didn't you come up last night?' she went on. "'We got up late and it took me till midnight to get things aboard. "'We shall have to hurry now. It'll take us all our time to get down on the tide.' He turned as he spoke, and as he did so, the child of the party, who had been watching him, stepped up to him. Her eight-year-old dignity was offended at having been ignored. "'How do you do?' she said ceremoniously, holding out a hand that was lost in a dark blue mitten. Bruce stopped short to look down at her. All he could see of her face was a pair of mischievous and inquiring blue eyes, haloed by a voluminous and floppy bonnet. Before he thought, he had taken that friendly little hand. Asia, her mother said coldly, Mr. Harding will help you into the boat. Absurdly hurt, David Bruce turned quickly away from her, but the child looked after him. I will get in myself, thank you, she said to Roy, with a comical dignity. As Bruce undid the ropes, he was vividly conscious of the little scene of embarkation. Helped by the Hardings, Alice Rowland finally got herself, her children, and her packages all safely into the punt. Bruce felt sorry for her when he saw her by, when he saw by her awkwardness and her uncertainty how utterly unfamiliar she was with travelling of that primitive kind, and looking ahead for her, he wondered how she would stand the rest of it. In spite of her behaviour to him, he liked the way she thanked the Hardings for their fortnight's hospitality. Something about her attitude as she stood with her face upturned to them attracted him to the second glance as he began to shove the punt away from the piles. Then he walked round the side of it at the back of the family group and slid down into the towboat where Sonny had the bow seat. Goodbye, Mr. Bruce, called the Hardings together. Come along soon. Thanks, I will, he waved his cap at them. Then, with sweeping strokes, which Sonny Shawman ached to rival, Bruce swept the towboat ahead, and the punt drew away from the landing. The Harding stood till the last vestige of Asia's wavering handkerchief disappeared around the first bend. Then they looked at each other. Roy shrugged his shoulders. Poor thing, said Dorry. However will she stand it? The Lord knows. She was rotten to Bruce. She'll have to learn sense. She'll alter when she's had a few weeks of that loneliness. And then David will shine beside Roland once he's had a clean shave. She spoke significantly. He looked at her. Hmm, I hadn't thought of that. She laughed with feminine suggestiveness. Well, I have. They walked back, turning several times to watch the passage of the punt between the mangroves. Tears glistened in Dory's eyes. She read into Alice Rowland's future things her husband did not think of. Meantime, in the punt, Alice occupied herself with the immediate problem of coping with the cold, which was to be considered before the remote issues of this dreaded excursion into unknown wilds. Betty, who was just three years old and the baby, who had just had her first birthday, both chose the occasion to howl piteously at this dislocation of accustomed ways. Alice, who could not bear anything belonging to her should misbehave in public, exerted all her forces of comfort and cajolery. Asia heroically helped her mother with the children, as she always called them. But she burned to investigate this wonderful adventure. Presently, when the baby was soothed to sleep on an improvised bed in a bath tin, and when Betty was pacified, she felt she was free. Then she darted with the spasmodic rapidity of a squeezed wet bean from one part of the punt to the other, scrambling over the tarpaulin and calling every few minutes in gasping whispers to her mother to look. Her life, spent so far only in cities, had contained no hints of the wonders of silence and space of the mysteries of forest depths and rustling trees, 
the strange ways of the free creatures of the air and earth. She clasped her hands, electrified and speechless, as startled wild duck rose from hidden places, or ungainly shags flapped an erratic course downstream, or gorgors croaked from the heights. Then Alice stood up. The only thing that seemed to belong to her in that incongruous setting of boxes and mattresses and common furniture was a piano, which was packed in a heavy case. It had cost Bruce an anxious hour the night before, till with the help of the chance riders he had got it safely aboard. Against the end of it now she leaned, her proud profile clearly visible to Bruce, who kept looking away from it and back again. He wondered if the scenery was getting her as it had got him the first time he came down that magic river. He vividly remembered the morning when he had piloted the boss to the Kauri forest at Pukekaroro. It had been a case of the blind leading the blind down that winding channel. But in spite of strandings in the mud and the boss's temper, Bruce had felt the call of the wild and had accepted the offer to stay. He wondered once, as he saw Alice's face turned towards a gorge in the mountains, if she had felt about it all as he had done. He knew that one might well forget the petty facts of life in the midst of that tremendous scenery. The river was a mere thread at the bottom of the narrow valley, which was walled up on either side by precipitous hills that kept sunlight out till midday. From the mangrove banks, to the sky, a great variety of trees and fifty shades of evergreen covered every yard of space. There was a riotous spring colour in the forest, voluptuous gold and red and the clumps of yellow kofi and the crimson rata, and there were masses of greeny white clematis and bowers of pale green ferns to rest the satiated eye. Stiff, Laurel-like Paredes stood beside the drooping fringe of the lacy rimu, and blackish kahikateas brooded over the oak-like taikoti, with its lovely scarlet berry. Nowhere in the world is there more variety. Here nature hated the very beginnings of monotony, so she scattered a little of everything about those wonderful hills. Towering arrogantly above all else, on the crests and down the spurs, stood groups of the kauri, the giant timber tree of New Zealand, whose great grey trunks, like the pillars in the ancient halls of Karnak, shot up seventy and eighty feet without a knot or branch, and whose colossal heads, swelling up into the sky, made a cipher of every tree near. Round each bend there was a fresh gully, a new and stimulating vista, and everywhere there was a vibrating sense a terribly lonely silence, but really broken by the note of a singing bird. In springtime it was a cold, windy, rain-washed land. It lacked the fierce blues and flame colours of Australia. Its days never palpitated with the exciting hum of that tropical land. Its nights were chaste and chilly. No soft, lascivious stars caressed its rear wandering lovers. Its winds growled harshly or sighed mournfully, blowing over dead men's bones, for the river and its hills were one of the gateways to the land of the lost. The first thing that struck Alice about it all was its appalling isolation. Every mile of it meant a mile farther from even such limited civilization as she had just left behind. Every hour of it meant so much more of a life cut off from the only thing she knew and loved. Every bend in the river meant another fearful look forward and another yearning look back. It was just eight o'clock now, and they were to go on like this hour after hour, until two or perhaps three in the afternoon. For the last fortnight she had been alternately shirking it and facing it. Each day had further intensified her fear. Once, as she turned, Bruce saw the expression on her face. All sense of hurt left him as he realised that she was horribly afraid.